everyone. My name is Brianna Lisenby, and I am a WSU Global Campus student working on getting my degree in Business Management and Operations. I am also currently serving as the ASWSU Online Vice President. I am excited to be here representing Global Campus students tonight. The WSU Global Campus Global Connections Program strives to bring campus-like experiences and activities to our Global Campus students, while also strengthening relationships among our students and with our on-campus partners. Our speaker tonight is one example of this commitment. This talk is being webcast live to global campus students throughout the state, nation, and internationally. We would like to thank our program partners for this event. They are the Student Entertainment Board, the Anthropology Graduate Organization, and the Common Reading Program. I would now like to introduce you to our speaker for this evening. Dr. Kevin Bales is co-founder of Free the Slaves, an organization dedicated to ending slavery worldwide. He has a doctorate from London School of Economics, and is one of the world's leading experts on modern slavery. He has gone undercover to meet slaves and slaveholders to expose how modern slavery penetrates the global economy and flows into the things we buy. He is the author of numerous books on modern slavery and has won a Peabody Award and two Emmy Awards for a film based on a book he co-wrote called Disposable People. Please welcome Dr. Kevin Bales. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Are you still there, Brianna? Oh, I was gonna ask if that was her child that we kept hearing, or if she has a parrot, or, you know, or what, so we'll see. Thank you, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I've never been introduced by an Android before. I'm really impressed with the offline and online learning here at WSU, and I'm, I think it's phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I've been seeing a lot of people in different classes today. I've, I've been having a whole lot of fun here. I feel like I've eaten in like maybe every restaurant in town. But I'm also very grateful. Brianna named a whole bunch of groups, anthropology, distance learning people, the deans. You always have to thank the deans and so forth. But I'm also very th thankful and appreciating being here. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about contemporary slavery. I'm going to show you little chunks of film and stuff like that. But I want to um, just explain, yeah, I'm going to introduce you to the modern anti-slavery movement and give you a tiny bit of history. I'm going to tell you about the size and shape of slavery in the world today. I'm going to give you, take a, on a little tiny detour into a brand new piece of information that I haven't ever talked about before because it's brand new research for a book that hasn't come out yet that will be shocking and, and just amazing. To, no, maybe not. And then I want to wrap up talking about how we can actually bring slavery, slavery to an end. The first thing I want to do, though, is to tell you something about the very beginnings of anti-slavery work in the world. Because one of the things that's kind of surprising is that it actually all started with an undergraduate essay question. Now, I know that you're very se serious scholars here at WSU, or WASU, or WAZU, or, or everyone, everyone says it. And so I know I don't need to translate Latin for you, because you're serious, right? I know you've done your classics. I know you're, you get this. But back in 1785, 1785, a teacher from Cambridge University in England went to a trial, to observe a trial in London, and was so shocked by what he saw that it made him decide that he was going to threaten authority by writing an essay question. See, that's the way professors think. I'm going to threaten authority by writing a question, an essay. It'll just be so shocking. Right? Which was actually much more effective than one might think. The trial that he went to see was the trial that had to do with the slave ship, the Zong. Z-O-N-G. It's a really interesting situation. The captain of the Zong had gone to West Africa, picked up a whole load of slaves, was taking them to Jamaica across the Atlantic. He wasn't a terribly good captain. He missed, he was actually very sick, very ill. He missed Jamaica, like literally missed Jamaica, and went on through into the Caribbean. And by the time they got past Jamaica, he realized, we've run out of food, we're running out of water. If we don't do something, there are all the slaves that we have on the ship to sell in Jamaica are going to die, and we won't have enough uh, slaves left to make any profit on this voyage. So he said, I know what we'll do. We're going to throw a bunch of the slaves overboard, drown them, just get rid of them, so that there'll be just enough food and water for the ones that we want to hold on to. So they started with the women and the children, the weak ones, and the ones that wouldn't bring in as much money. And they just did that. They threw them overboard. They were still in their chains. They ran them over the sides. And 162 human beings were murdered by throwing them overboard into the Caribbean. 
And they made it back to Jamaica. They sold the slaves that they had. And then they had the audacity to come back to London and make a claim on their insurance for the slaves that they had murdered by throwing them overboard. Now remember, this is taking place at a time when slavery is perfectly legal in all countries. It's part of the national economy. In fact, it's a very important part of the national economy. The churches at that time are actually in favor of it. So the Church of England and others are saying, yes, you know, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And in fact, the church, the Anglican church, actually owned slave plantations in Jamaica at that time. So there was a big fight in the court, but the, the sickening thing was that the fight wasn't about murdering 162 people. It was about whether or not you should actually pay an insurance claim or not. Like, was it a fair insurance claim or a not fair insurance claim? The question of murder came into it. The teacher who went to see this trial said, I can't do much, but I can, in fact, call something into question in a world where everyone who's in charge of me, the king, the government, the church, everybody believes slavery is fine. I can at least do this. I'm going to set the annual essay contest question. And the annual essay contest was a really big deal in England at that time, because the person who won it, the student who won it, would be guaranteed a great job for life for winning the national essay contest. So he wrote as his Latin question, is it moral to enslave others against their will? Is it moral to enslave others against their will? And I can see you immediately understand the implication that it's, it's turning what was seen as an economic activity into a moral question. So it wasn't like the insurance claim, which was, is it fair to claim on the insurance in this way? It was, is this moral to, to even engage in this in for the first place? Now, how on earth does that turn into an anti-slavery movement? Because of somebody like you. That's why I always like to tell this story when I talk to a university. Because there was a student who was not from a rich background, even though he was at Cambridge University, which is a kind of hoity-toity university. And he really, really wanted to win the contest so he could have a really good job. You know that kid at your seminar that always does the reading, who's never asleep, right? It's like this kid that makes you a little crazy because you can never quite compete because he's like studying all the time. That, this kid was like that. His name was Thomas Clarkson. And he was just absolutely determined, I'm going to win this contest. So he began to do research about the slaves, the slave trade, everything there was to know about this. And in the process of that research, in the process of digging, digging down and reading the diaries and the narratives of people who had been in slavery, it changed him. And he went from being the kid who was going to do anything to get the great job to the kid who realized, I have to do something about this. I have to do something. So even though he won the contest and was offered the great jobs in government that would have been for life, he turned it all down because he said, if everything I've learned in the process of, of preparing this essay is true, I have to do something about it. And just after he graduated, he went to London. And he got with 12 other people. And they formed a little tiny committee, which was the first human rights group in human history, the first non-governmental organization in human history, the first NGO, and the first anti-slavery group in human history. Now, the reason I put this up is because nobody's heard of Thomas Clarkson. Or maybe one or two of you have heard of Thomas Clarkson. But you all know Thomas Clarkson because he drew this picture. Who hasn't seen this picture? The picture of, of the slaves jammed into the slave ship, right? It's in all of our history books. So everybody's seen this, right? Just not. Yes, you have. I thought you had. What you don't know is that how this affected people then. Though. This was like a horror movie. Because they didn't see this as, a, as an old historical kind of quaint picture. They looked at this because they knew what it was like to travel on a wooden ship in a, in a tumultuous ocean. And they knew that if people were chained down like this, it meant that they would be lying, chained to corpses in their own excrement and vomit for weeks and weeks. Because that's what, it, they, that's what happened. 
And because they knew the world of wooden ships, they actually understood that immediately when they saw that. People used to see this and get sick and throw up. Posters of it would make them sick and throw up because they understood what it actually meant. They had no concept of what had actually happened. It was a shocking, like, documentary. And it led to those 12 people doing something that was impossible. 12 people, none of them were rich, none of them were aristocrats or governmental officials or anything like that. They were just regular people. One was just graduated from college. He was 21, 22. And impossible because it was legal. It was endorsed by the church. It was completely part of the economy, of the national economy. The slave trade at that time, according to economic historians, would be the equivalent of the global automotive industry today. So it would be as if I said, OK, guys, everybody get your seats into a circle, because we're going to sit here tonight and plot how we're going to destroy the global automotive industry. It sounds kind of impossible, though usually there are some people, I see a couple of people are like, yeah, all right, destroy those cars. Right. How long did it take them to achieve their first goal? Just 12 of them, no money, all that kind of stuff, which was to end the slave trade in the British Empire? 20 years. Which, if you're as old as I am, is like that. If it's like your age, it's like that's an eternity, right? 20 years. But in, in global movement building and human rights, 20 years really is nothing. OK. I want to, oh, nothing happened just now. There we go. I want to, I, I'm done with that little history bit. But I like to explain always that all of this starts with college students, right? All of this started with one college student who came from an unprivileged background who decided he had to do the right thing, and he changed the planet. He changed the world. He did something more historically powerful than Napoleon or Caesar or anybody else, right? By abol abolishing slavery across a very long period. He lived to be a really old man and actually saw the end of the American Civil War, saw all this other stuff. And was people, and they kind of held him up as this old guy, kind of like BB King or something, you know. But you know, it it and it and it worked. Now, when I'm talking about slavery, then, and when I'm talking about slavery now, I'm talking about the same thing. Slavery has always been what slavery is. There, I don't get confused and think there's some kind of old slavery and there's some kind of new slavery, or slavery only exists when people are illegally enslaved. Or, or, and this is something else that happens today. Slavery predates the invention of law. So it's prehistoric. We know that. It existed before written history. It existed before written laws. It's been around for a very long time. But it's always been about having that kind of control, one person having the kind of control over another person, that would be as if, as if they owned them, and they could do anything they wanted to with them that you can do with something that belongs to you that you own. You could buy and sell and control and manage and use and profit and transfer, and you can mistreat and you destroy if you want to. Because you can destroy the things you own. You can destroy the things you own. Or you can just throw them away. You can dispose of them. Now, the reason I put it up like this to define it is this is, this is the 1926 United Nations Convention defines it in this way. I've paraphrased it slightly, but it talks about being able to treat a person as if you own them. You don't have to literally own them. It's just as if you own them. We know from quite a bit of serial pieces of research that around the world today, there are about 27 million people in that situation. And I'm not talking about bad jobs, and I'm not talking about bad relationships. I'm talking about in real unequivocal, undebatable, indubitable slavery. Right? Now, where does that happen? And how does that happen? Well, how some of that comes up about is because of 27 million. I mean, how we get 27 million is because there have, been, there have been very significant things happening in the last 50 and 100 years, but especially the last 50 years. There's been this population explosion that you all know about. We're at over 7 billion now. When I was born, there were only 2.5 billion people on the planet. Now there's 7 billion. Now it's true that I'm 114 years old, but you know, I've seen that change. And there's a lot more people than there used to be. There used to be nobody would be in this room. It was just like five of us. It was really different. But that, having lots of people doesn't make 
Does it make people slaves? But you have to add in these other factors to, to create that situation. And the key thing is about vulnerability, so that people become vulnerable to people who want to take control of them. That can happen in a lot of ways. Poverty, wars, corrupt and kleptocratic governments, natural disasters, you name it. Those things can push people into situations where they're very much at a loss and can't maintain their own stability and security. But you know, even being poor and being a lot of people who are poor doesn't make you slave. To really turn a person into a slave, to really exercise that total control over another person, you've got to do it without the rule. The rule of law has to break down. There has to be corruption, right? Or the rule of law breaking down. Because if the rule of law will protect you, even if you're poor and vulnerable, then how, who can take you into slavery? If you can dial 911 and they'll come and stop it, OK. But in those countries where people are poor and vulnerable and the rule of law doesn't work, it becomes much easier to take a person into slavery. Now, there's about six or 700 million people in the world who live in countries where they're poor, vulnerable, numerous, and the rule of law doesn't work. So in a strange way, we're actually not doing as badly as we might if there's only 27 million people in slavery. But it's always about that lack of, of protection. Where are they? Well, here's a map that gives you a rough notion of the density of slaves around the world. There's slavery in every single country. I used to say there's used no slavery in every single country except Iceland. And then I met one of the somebody in the Icelandic government. And they said, I don't know why you keep saying that. We got, you know, it's happening here too. But the darker red colors, pinks, that's where the higher numbers are, the lighter, bluer colors, greener colors are, where fewer are. But again, no country without slavery. The largest raw numbers of prevalence of slavery are are in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, then large amounts around the west, northwest coast of Africa and so forth. But while the densities are higher there, and Haiti, they're very high in Haiti, um, no, no place without slavery, none. Now, I, oh wait, first I, sh I should apologize I'm putting this question up in front of a bunch of university students who may be graduating someday, and this may be the only time anyone asks you this question in your lives. And I know, I know that's a bit of a tantalizing, cruel thing for me to put up. But that's not why I'm putting it up. I'm putting it up because I wanted to explain that there's slavery all around the world, but the people who come into slavery today, there are still hereditary slaves. There are still hereditary slaves. But when people are brought into slavery for the first time today, it's usually not about someone knocking them over the head or kidnapping them or rounding them up and putting them on a ship. It's because someone asks them this question. All over the world, in lots of different countries, I've been told an almost identical story by people. And it always goes kind of like this. I was in my village or I was on my farm or wherever, and this guy came up in a truck. And he got up in the back of his truck and he said, I've got work. I've got really good jobs. And they're just you know, like 20 miles from here. Just get in the truck and you can come with me and I'm going to pay good money and everything is going to be great. And the person that's told me this story in different languages in different places usually pauses at that point and says, and you know this guy, he looked sketchy. You know, He did not look, I, was, I didn't know about him. Looked a little dubious. But my kids were hungry. My wife needed medicine. She was really sick. And I thought, I have to get in the truck. I have to go. I have to earn some money for my kids. So they get in the back of the truck. They drive off. And anywhere between a mile and a 1,000 miles later, somebody begins to make, take control of them as if they are proper. They use violence, beat them lock them up, put a gun to their head, make it very clear to them that they're no longer a free person, that they're, that they're going to do exactly what they're told to do. Sometimes slaveholders, when they trick people like that into slavery, 
won't let them know they're in slavery for weeks. Because it's a lot easier to sneak somebody into a foreign country if they're cooperating with you. It's a lot easier to get people to work at first if they think they're going to earn some money. And people have talked to me about how after a month of horrible treatment and bad labor where they've worked really hard because they were really hoping to earn some money, they finally said, screw this. I'm out of here. We're not going to put up with this. This is not what you promised. And then that's when the gun comes out. That's when they are beaten up. That's when they're sexually assaulted. And they realize, no, this isn't what I thought it was. There is one new thing about slavery. And it's a very curious thing because we, you know, a lot of people look at slavery today and they think, well, it must be different now because we have the internet or something like that. It's not. The one new thing about slavery in the last 4,000 years is that the price of human beings has collapsed. Now, a really good way to illustrate that is actually something I saw on, on Bloomberg, and I want to just share that with you. May Jada live from the trading floor. Thanks, May. Okay, lively discussion guaranteed here as always as we get macro and talk commodities. Continuing here in the studio with our guest Michael O'Donoghue, Head of Commodities at Four Continents Capital Management. And we're also joined by Brent Lawson from Lawson Frisk Securities. Happy to be here. Good to have you with us, Brent. Now, gentlemen, Brent, where's your money going this year? Well, Daphne, we've been going short on gas and oil recently and casting our net just a little bit wider. We really like the human being story a lot. Uh, if you look at a long-term chart, prices are at historical lows, and yet global demand for forced labor is still real strong. So that's a scenario that we think we should be capitalizing on. Michael, what's your take on the people's story? Are you interested? Well, definitely. Non-voluntary labor's greatest advantage as an asset is the endless supply. We're not about to run out of people. No other commodity has that. Daphne, if I may draw your attention to one thing, that is that private equity has been sniffing around, and that tells me that this market is about to explode. Uh, Africans and Indians, as usual, uh, South Americans, and Eastern Europeans in particular are on our buy list. Interesting. Michael, bottom line, what's your recommend? We're recommending to our clients a buy and hold strategy. There's no need to play the market. There's a lot of vulnerable people out there. It's very exciting. Exciting stuff indeed. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Please stay with us. We'll be back after this short break with further insights into this fascinating market. Okay, a couple of you look uh, a little outraged. Uh, you need, it's a, it's a spoof, okay? He was just about to leap to his feet and say, no, we, it's, no, no. Right. No, it's a spoof. Okay, it's a spoof. I, I worked with MTV, and we made this a, a while back. And in Europe, we used to put it in between the music videos so that it would look as if you'd like bump the remote, and you were suddenly on Bloomberg, and then you were getting this. But we wouldn't put anything else just so it's just. <laughs> okay, so but, it's, but, but at the same time, I wanted you to see it because A, it's kind of fun and kind of surprising, but also because if slavery were still legal, that's exactly what they'd be doing. Because here's the reality. In the last 4,000 years, most of the time, slaves have been fairly high-priced investment items. The average price of an average slave averaged over the last something like 4,000 years is about forty to $50,000. That price has now, that acquisition cost for human beings has now completely collapsed and is down to about $90. Now, I'll give you one example. If you go back to Alabama in 1850 and you say, how much do slaves cost? Well, there we have really, really good data because they kept track of every slave sale in the Deep South and their insurance records and their inheritance records and everything because they were so valuable. But we know that in, in 1850, if you wanted to buy a 19-year-old agricultural worker, which was the average slave, a young guy who was strong, didn't have any special skills, but could work in the fields, a 19-year-old agricultural worker would cost between $1,000 and $1,250. So what else could you buy in 1850 for $1,000? Well, you could buy a whole nice house for $1,000 or one 19-year-old field worker. $1,850, $1,000 is worth about $40,000, $45,000 in today's money. That's the way it's been until, and notice that population explosion line on the chart, the red line, as the population went straight through the ceiling, 
the glut of potential and enslavable people, the pool of the enslavable people increased and increased. It's classic supply and demand, oversupply, collapse in price, and we're down to an acquisition cost globally of about, about $90. It varies enormously according to where you are. If you wanted to, to, to acquire or purchase a human being in, in America, you have to be paying up in the somewhere between, say, four and $8,000 on average. But if you wanted to do the same in someplace like Uttar Pradesh, India, where it's really, you're out in the boondocks and it's really poor, you could probably do it for 20 bucks. So the averaging across the planet is about 90 because most of the people who are caught up in slavery in the world are not living in the rich places, they're living in the poor places. The outcome of that collapse in price is that people have gone from being investments, like buying a giant tractor or something, because it costs 40,000 or $100,000, to being disposable inputs. It's the difference between investing in a big piece of equipment and buying styrofoam cups that you can just buy, use, crumple up, and throw away. The, the cost of a human being, the acquisition cost of a human being is so low that people have become disposable. And that's why one of the books I wrote, the first book I wrote about this, I called Disposable People. Let me introduce you to some disposable slave kids, right? These guys work in, live in Nepal. They were enslaved by quarry, somebody who runs a, a stone quarry. There are not many roads in Nepal, so a lot of things are carried around in Nepal on people's backs up and down mountain trails. These kids carry blocks of stone often weighing more than they do. And they do it up and down rocky paths with cliffs and mountainsides and rock slides and the whole thing. And that's it. They do this 12, 15, 16 hours a day. They do it with very little food. They get injured. The straps do weird things to their spines. They get broken. They break, fall down and break legs. If they do, if they, if they do break a leg, they'll often just be kicked over the edge of a cliff and dropped into a crevasse or whatever, or down a ravine, because it's much, much more cost effective to just get another kid than it would be to take the kid to the doctor. These kids are disposable rock carriers. I mean, they're, they're operating at that level of rudimentary economic activity. Now, I'll tell you, these kids now are liberated. We, have, we do a lot of work in... In, in Nepal, in this zone, these kids have been liberated, but I gotta tell you, there's still plenty more in that same space that are doing that kind of work. Now, this is where I wanna, I wanna take a, this little tiny detour and tell you about some new research, and I, in part because there's a lot of work that goes on at this university, which is environmental, and I think it's an important thing to touch on. Now, I know this sounds a little funny, but this is what a friend of mine looked over some of this new research that I was doing, and said, oh my God, that's a match made in disaster heaven. And what she was talking about was the relationship that I had discovered, the tight, intimate relationship that I had found between slavery and environmental destruction. How slaves are being used to accomplish a great deal of the environmental destruction that's going on around the world. Let me give you an example. Let me just t show you one space where I've done, been doing work on this. I've worked in a number of countries on this, but to just start with, just do Brazil and just the Amazon. Now this is, I appreciate, a kind of a hard map to understand, and we won't spend a lot of time on it, but the red dots are murders, and the blue dots are slavery cases, slavery cases found by the government. And the size of the dots indicates, for the blue dots, how many slaves are there. So, okay, we're in some part of Brazil and there's a lot of people being enslaved and there's a lot of people being murdered. But here's the key thing for you to look at. It's about the yellow and green colors. The green that you see there, you can see up at the top, the big river, that's the Amazon. And the Amazon basement, basin, basement, maybe they have those too, I don't know. The Amazon basin is the green zone, right? That's where the forest is still intact. That's the part we're really interested in preserving and, and at least taking care of in some way. The yellow arc is where that forest has been cut and cleared and, and turned into grazing land or whatever. Notice that the slavery and murder cases, and these are all the slavery and murder cases reported to the police in that, dis, in that area, 
that they follow that arc of destruction, that where the destructive forces are pushing into the Amazon is where the slaveries and the murders are happening. And you can look at some little places like way up, I wonder if I can point up there, I don't think so, the big blue dot, which is, means more than 100 slave cases, and then a, the big circle of red dots, each one of those is a murder. It's about criminals who are engaged in murder, happily engaging in slavery, happily engaging in environmental destruction. Because I can tell you that people who don't mind destroying the environment don't mind destroying human lives. And people who, criminals that don't mind destroying human lives don't mind destroying the environment as well. What does that look like? Okay, I've shown it to you like from outer space, but let's zoom down a little bit. Here's a charcoal camp in that part of Brazil that I, I was able to locate. I'd been to this one and I was able to locate it on Google Earth. Those little dots down there with the smoke, each one of those is something about this big where they are burning the forest to make charcoal, not for barbecues, but to feed the steel industry. The steel that they're making is the same steel that they make into, into parts and particularly the bodies of your cars. So that steel on the outside of your car, a lot of that's Brazilian steel. And it will have been made very often, if not normally, with slave-produced charcoal that turns the iron ore into steel. Now, you can see what's going on there, right? They've gone into a piece of land. It could be government land. It could be a national forest. It could be a protected wildlife zone. And they've said, we're going to set up some charcoal ovens. And we're just going to start cutting all the wood and burning it to make charcoal that we then ship over to the another part of Brazil to make into steel. And you can see that everything on the right side of this air photo used to be forest. It's now been clear cut. Everything on the left side is the forest that they're about to clear cut. And I'm, I wish the lights were a little bit better and be a little bit sharper, but you can pretty much see what's going on there. What does that look like as we, I'm continuing to zoom in? Here's a guy hauling charcoal. You can see those bumps behind him, those, those sort of dome shape, those beehives. Those are the bumps that you saw in the picture before, the ones that you could see in a big line. Those were those bumps, those clay charcoal things, all fed with wood, cut by hand, chopped by hand, loaded by hand, burned by hand. Not a factory. Slave level work. Slave level work. Dirty, dangerous, demeaning, bottom of the rung. And here's an enslaved worker with a, with a big bucket, with a big barrel that he's filled with charcoal that he's actually climbing up to put in the back of a truck to be taken off to the, to the factory. Here's what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like as they're tearing it all down and clearing. It's all, and it's all not just for destruction. It's not just about clearing the land and putting cattle or anything like that. The thing that's, that's, that's ominous about this is that this and almost every other type of large-scale environmental destruction that I was able to get up close to and study in Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, Bangladesh, Brazil, Peru, wasn't just for locals. It was to feed the global export economy that brought things to us like steel in this situation. Now, let me give you a notion of what we've been working through in this measurement. I'm, I, on the, I'm still on my little detour about this new work on slavery and environmental destruction. But just to give you a sense of the strange, almost paradoxical balance of this, is that if slavery were a state or a country, right? If slavery were a state, it would have the same number of people in it, has the same number of people in it as the state of Texas or the country of Nepal. It would have the gross domestic product, you know, the economic outputs of North Dakota. It's about 40 to $50 billion a year. That's what North Dakota generates in a year, or it's what Ecuador generates in a year. So it would be a small country. It would be a one state, right? Not the United States would be one state. But what about in terms of CO2? CO2 is our big problem. How much CO2 does all of that work with slaves produce? Where would it stand then? At the level of Ecuador? No. Number three, 
China is the largest emitter, then the United States, then the European Union, unless you calculate up conservatively, very conservatively, how much deforestation and other forms of CO2 emission are occurring through slave labor. And then you, slavery is not Ecuador, it's <laughs> the third largest emitter. Now this is both horrific and positive. It's like negative and positive. It's horrific that it's CO2, environmental destruction and CO2 emissions increased in ways that we can't control. Why? Because it's criminals. And we have to fight it in a different way. On the other hand, a couple of positive things come out. One is that while around the world there are people who are arguing about whether or not there's global warming, and they talk about it as if it's some kind of ideological issue, they don't do that about slavery. No one is saying, well, slavery, you know, it's just a theory, right? They don't say that. They say it's wrong, right? And if slaves are being used to destroy the environment and, and dramatically increase the amount of CO2 that's being emitted, we don't have to have an argument about why CO2 is CO2, global warming, blah, blah. We don't have to do that. We just have to say slavery, it's a crime, enforce the law, and we'll have, hopefully, a significant diminution, a significant decrease in, in emission if we can enforce those laws around the world. Now, that's all part of a larger story that I want to wrap up with. I, want to, I kind of want to kind of go to the end of this. Because I've been telling you terrible things. 27 million people, children use like disposable animals, destruction of the, of the world's natural resources, all about slavery. But I want to tell you why we can actually do something about this. This is a little cryptic, I understand. But it's so that I can point to that other paradox of numbers and approaches. 27 million people in slavery. It's a lot of people. It's double the number that came out of Africa in the entire 350 years of the transatlantic slave trade. But it's also in a global population of 7 billion people, the tiniest fraction of the world population to ever be in slavery. So at no time has the number of people in slavery on planet Earth been as low as it is today. Those slaves, those 27, billion, billion, 27 million slaves, they put out, in terms of economic output, about 40 to 50 billion dollars a year in all kinds of goods and services. Now, 40, 50 billion dollars, that's a lot of money. I don't have that kind of money. But in the global economy of something like, I don't know what the global economy is, it's huge. Nobody can quite give me a straight answer. Is it 20 billion, or 20 trillion, is it 25 trillion, 15 trillion? I don't know, but I do know that whichever number the global economy is supposed to be, 50 billion is a drop, a single drop in an ocean. In other words, like the reduced fraction of the global population that's slaves, their role in the global economy is reduced to the tiniest fraction it's ever been. And it's illegal in every country. And everyone agrees now, except for the criminals, that it's morally repugnant and we must get rid of it. Slavery has actually been pushed right to the edges of our global society. It's right out there and just pushed to the very edges. It's like hiding under the rocks, hidden away as a hidden crime. It's standing on the brink of its own extinction. And if we give it a good hard kick, we can actually get rid of it. We can actually end it. Now, that's a pretty startling claim, but let me show you how we, we know that can happen. How much does it cost to get people out of slavery? Well, for the last 12 years, we've been getting a lot of people out of slavery. Not as many as I'd like, but thousands. Thousands of people have been coming out of slavery. And we've been very carefully calculating what does it cost to get people out of slavery? And when I say get people out of slavery, let me be really clear about one thing. We do not buy people out of slavery, right? Don't do that. That buying a person out of slavery is like paying a burglar to get your television back. It's a betting a crime. You don't do that. 
And when I say getting people out of slavery, I don't mean just rescuing them and dropping them somewhere. I mean re getting them out either through rescue or helping them in other ways or through community organizing, whatever it takes to move them from slavery to freedom, but then sticking with them for usually two to three years until they've reached a point of safety, economic aut autonomy, they can support themselves, they've got basic education, they've become citizens and they've learned their, their rights, and they've got a sense of their own dignity and mental health and recuperation, so that they become strong people who you can't make slaves again because they know their rights and they're educated and so forth. And they're, and they're not vulnerable because they've been earning their own money. That's what the slave's calling in right now. It's like, I'm better, the things are good. Right? Now, how much does that cost, that whole process of taking someone from slavery to a point where they're really functioning citizens who are safe from, from slavery? Well, you know, in India, up in India, in northern India, where things cost pennies, because it's such a depressed and poor area, the cost for us is of something like $150 to take that family out of slavery and take them through that process in their community. Now this family was great. I gotta tell you a couple of stories about this family. This family was in hereditary slavery. So granddad there was born a slave. His son, whose name is Ramphal, was born a slave. His two kids were born slaves. They were all enslaved by the same boss master who owned the, his small village and kept them in a quarry. They were in a stone quarry. Dirty, dangerous, <laughs> low-level jobs, typical of slavery. This is the family just after they were liberated. And you can kind of tell by their slightly frightened, slightly confused looks that something big has just happened, but they don't know where it's gonna go. This little boy over here, Gabriel, whose name was Gabriel, and there was other names, but we left that off, was tricked away from his mother in Ghana with the promise of a job in the fishing industry in Lake Volta in Ghana. And then when he was taken to Lake Volta, he wasn't taken to the place he, they, he, their, his mother was told he would go. He was taken somewhere else. And then he was enslaved in a fi on a fishing boat where he was, had rocks tied to his ankles so he could go and untangle nets. And if they didn't pull him up in time, he'd be choking and almost drowning. His kids he knew were drowned in that situation. It was a horrible, horrible life. They only had fish guts to eat. They were beaten up all the time. They would be sexually assaulted and so forth. But he, he, was, he was nabbed by one of our partner organizations. He was brought out and put into, a, into rehabilitation. All of that cost about $400 in Ghana. Now, if you wanna do the same thing with someone who's been enslaved in the United States, it'll cost something like 30,000 and up. Medical care, legal expenses, all of that kind of stuff in the United States, this is an expensive place. And it'll cost that much over a three or four year period. The same in Western Europe. But most of the people who are in slavery don't live in the United States or in places where things are really expensive. They live in places like India and, and, and Africa where things are much less expensive to accomplish. And in fact, the average, averaged across the volume in different countries of getting people out of slavery globally is about $400. So you've got a calculator, 400 times 27 million. That's right, 10.8 billion. <laughs> there are some people who can do math here, it's great. Now, if you multiply it up, 10.8 billion. Okay, again, more money than I've got, more money than you've probably got, unless anyone's got it, I wanna talk to you, okay, afterwards. We'll sort some things out, we'll hold, name the whole thing after you, get naming, branding rights, you know, the, tell me your name. She's not gonna do it. They're so shy up out here. So it's like the Anastasia civil rights and human rights anti-slavery movement of the 21st century. That, that will be its call, named, named after you, because you put in the 10 billion. But 10 billion, while it's a lot of money, in many ways, again, in the global economy, well, 10 billion is what Americans spent on movie tickets last year, right? 10.8 billion is exactly what they spent on movie tickets last year. 10.8 billion, is what Seattle, you've been to Seattle, right? Is Seattle is spending on its tram system, the one that's not working yet, and they've already spent a lot of the money. 
10.8 billion is what the deadbeat dads in the state of Texas owe in child support, which tells you something about Texas, I think. But not that I've got anything against Texans, but numbers don't lie, right? The point is that in global terms, 10.8 billion is really chicken feed. And we don't even need 10.8 billion this year. We need 10.8 billion over a period of 25 to 30 years to carry through programs of emancipation, liberation, rehabilitation, reintegration to make that all happen. That's exciting to me because we know we can do this because we actually know how to carry out those programs. But there's more yet, and there's more. Right? There's if the only reason we wanted to get people out of slavery was because it was good for the economy, we would be jerks. But it's kind of nice that it's, in fact, good for the economy. When people come out of slavery, we've been doing longitudinal research on this as well. When those people like Ramfall in his village, when they come out of slavery and they begin to work for themselves and they can build their own lives and they can actually buy things, which they've never been able to do before because you can't buy things when you're a slave, they create a cycle of consumption and production. What we have discovered that any place there's significant slavery and the slavery ends, the, local, the economy just rises and rises and rises. Even, and this is ironic and a little weird, but even the slaveholders do better economically in places like northern India when slavery comes to an end. That they make more money running shops that they sell things to ex-slaves than they did in getting the labor out of the slaves when they had them in slavery. So even if we put in 10.8 billion, we'll be generating more into the economies, the global economies, than we put in in that work. Now, all of that is great. But I also have to point to why then are we doing it the way we do it, with these long periods of reintegration work and rehabilitation work. Because when we started this 12, 15 years ago, and we started to study what happened when people came out of slavery, what happened in human history when other people have come out of slavery, how did it work? One of the things we learned right away was that the last thing we want to do is to repeat the botched emancipation that occurred in the United States in 1865. Four million people were lifted up out of slavery and then dumped. No access to credit or asset formation. No access to decent education. No access to political participation. Discrimination, prejudice, violence. We're still paying the price in this country for the botched emancipation of 1865, right? The Emancipation Proclamation was fantastic. The 13th Amendment was fantastic. But they just, there was no 40 acres and a mule. There was no help. There was no truth and reconciliation. They blew it. They absolutely blew it. And the fact that they, about a, almost a million people died in the war leading up to a botched emancipation makes it even worse. See, we want to end slavery without a war and without anybody becoming a second class citizen. And that's, that's why it costs 10.8 billion. That's why it takes three years to work through the process, because we don't want to do that. We can really end slavery, though. That's what we've discovered. Every place we're doing it around the world, it's happening. And it's happening at those kinds of expenditures, which are not crazy expenditures. Now, what does that look like? I want to show you this, because it's just so cool. It makes me happy every time I see it. Those kids that got rescued from the fishing industry in Ghana, they went to the rehabilitation center, got healthy, fed up, medical care education, and then they have the day where they graduate to go back to their moms and dads. That's what it looks like. Sometimes people say to me, how can you work on such a really depressing subject? How depressing is that? I mean, this was the kind of stuff we get every day. It's just so exciting. OK, the last thing I want to talk about is a lot of students, since I've been here, have been talking about what can we do here? What can we do here at Washington State? And I wanted to just throw this up, because a bunch of students have, in fact, started to already organize an anti-slavery organization. And I say a slave-free wazoo. And I'm saying that 
because that sounds a little odd. I, I know you're thinking, wait, surely we don't have slaves here. And I'm not saying you have slaves here. But what I'm talking about is, you know, no city and no university in the United States has actually done the work to be able to say, we're a slave-free university. Now, what I mean by slavery is not just that you don't have any slaves at the university, but that you've made it so that every student, per, virtually every student, in the same way that you know about racial discrimination or gender equality stuff, that you would know how to recognize if there was a person who had been a human trafficking victim, even in your hometowns or someplace else. So you'd, you'd know how to recognize slavery, and you'd know how to act and what to do if you saw it. And that you've also, say, looked at all the athletic gear that's sold in the bookshop and said, did the cotton from this come from the right kind of source? Did the chocolate bars come from the right kind of so source that we can make sure that slavery is not creeping into the things that we're eating, into the things that we're using? You know, are we sure that we're doing the right things that way? And then also to say, what about our endowments? Do we have our investments for this university in the right kind of place? that we can make sure that we're not actually profiting from the steel that's come from those slave-made slave charcoal camps that are destroying the environment, or the cassiterite mines in Congo that are going into the cassiterite that's going into our cell phones and laptops, or the shrimp that we eat that were from the destroyed mangrove forests with the child slaves in the southern Bangladesh, and so forth and so forth. It's, it's not impossible to do that. It's not impossible to say, I'm not just going to be against slavery. I'm going to make a space where we're all against slavery to the point that we're, we're free of it. And we're able to lead others and help others how to find that. So apparently, you can join on KugSync, which is one of the silliest words I've ever heard in my life. KugSync, right? Or you can join on, I'm going to say it over and over, KugSync, right? I'm almost tempted to like name a dog Kooksink, but I don't know. It sounds funky, but it's not really. Okay. Anyway, on Monday, you can name your dog Kooksink, and you can also go on to Kooksink, and you can sign up for that group. Okay, here's the, the, the other place you can get information, our organization at freetheslaves.net. But I thank you very much for, for hearing me out. Thank you. Keep, keep going with that. I'm going to like try to do it over the roll of applause. So, okay, now. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, stop. Okay. <laughs> You're so obedient, it's hilarious. Um, what we want to do now is we're going to open it up for a question and answer. And I just, uh, please, I'm supposed to ask you, please, wait till you get to the mic and make sure the mic's working because you guys are in the room, you guys are in the house, but there's a, more than 160 people or 200 people are actually doing this online with us right now. So there's more people here than are there. No, actually, I think there's exactly the same number in the room as there are online. And that, in fact, each of you have a kind of matrix doppelganger person who's online watching this, but in a different dimension, in which I'm a woman. <laughs> and it's not actually about slavery, but it's OK. You know, it translates through the dimensional portal and all that sort of stuff. So who's got a question? Go, go, go. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Uh, you talked about slavery in East Europe. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. I thought you were going to go on a little longer. Then. No. Um, so she's asking about slavery in Eastern Europe. Well, there's a couple of things to say about, about slavery in and from Eastern Europe. One of the things that became very obvious at the end of the, of the Cold War in the early 90s was that when, the, when the, the, you know, the Iron Curtain dropped, people began to move out of Eastern Europe, out of the old communist countries, looking for jobs. They wanted to find opportunity. They wanted to get the heck out of horrible places that were communists with no jobs and so forth. And a lot of those people were asked that question, do you want a job? And a lot of those people got caught up in situations of enslavement. One of the things that brought modern slavery to our attention was that a lot of these were Eastern European women who had been brought into Western Europe and into North America and then tricked into working in prostitution. I mean, they were forced into prostitution. It was slave, they were enslaved commercial sex workers. One of the things that is less well known was that at the same time that that was happening, men from Eastern European countries were being trafficked the other direction. 
into places in, into like Russia, into construction work and enslaved there. And it's been a, we've only really come to understand that because we now know more about slavery in Eastern Europe than we know about it in almost any place in the world because the, one of the best sets of random sample surveys of who's been in slavery have been only done in Eastern European countries. So for the most part, the slavery there doesn't happen there. It happens somewhere else. But in some countries, it's also happening there. So it's not a long answer, but it's a good enough answer, I think, for the moment because it can go, you know, I kind of know too much about this, <laughs> so I have to try to be careful. Is there, is anybody over there? No, okay, oh, over here. Um, hi, I'm curious to know if your work includes uh, the slave trade in the U.S., like involving sex trafficking and human trafficking in the U.S.? Not too much. No. And the reason why I say that is I know you would expect me to be working on this in the U.S., and we do do some work in the United States, policy work, we advise the government, we do a number of things in the US. But the reason why we don't do a lot of work with say sex trafficking and other types of trafficking in the United States is because when we established our organization back in the year 2000, there were some really good American groups who were already ahead of us in the US, called, like the Polaris Project. And they're great. And we said, you know, if there's already good groups working in this country, Let's go work in those countries where there are no groups and, those, and places where there's actually a lot more slavery. In the United States, our best estimate, conservative estimate, is there's something like 40 to 50,000 people in slavery in the United States today. Le just under half are caught up in prostitution or commercial sexual exploitation. The next highest category, maybe 30, 20 to 5 to 30 percent, <coughs> pardon me, are domestic workers, then agricultural workers. And then you get amazing diversity in the equal opportunity employment of enslavement in the United States. I have met people who have been enslaved as hair braiders. I have met people who have been enslaved in a boys choir. I've met people who have been enslaved as circus performers in Las Vegas. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Anywhere really clever criminals can figure out ways to enslave people and put them to work in the United States, because we have really extra dynamic inventive criminals in this country. They will enslave people in this way. But something like that number. The good news is that we at least have decent law enforcement OK, and we don't have much corruption OK, but we don't have in the government putting anywhere near the amount of money into it that they should. I'm going to give you one tiny example of this. The government estimated a few years back that about 14,000 people a year are brought into the country to be enslaved, 14,000 trafficking victims per year being enslaved. How many murders do we have in the United States in a year? About 14,000. Yeah, about 14,000. So we have about 14,000 murder victims and about 14,000 human trafficking victims each year. And how many people do we have who are trained homicide detectives and like that? Well, about 45,000. We have 20,000 police departments, and you average up, and you've got like 40,000 police detectives who are trained and dealing with homicide all the time and spending about $4 billion a year on homicide for 14,000 murder victims. For 14,000 new slaves, we have about 200 people who have a tiny bit of training on slavery and trafficking. And we spend maybe $50 million. Now, doesn't that sound a little weird? But in fact, you can see what happens when you have that kind of discrepancy because we solve or, or clear about between 75 and 85 percent of the murders. We solve or clear about one half of one percent of all the slavery cases that we think are out there. Now that's crazy, right? Imagine if you picked up Time Magazine tomorrow and the cover said, great news, murders the, uh, the sol murder solved has gone up to 1%. You'd think we live in chaos, right? We like to live in the Wild West. But that's where we are on slavery. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> you mentioned that you've been to a bunch of these different sites that have slavery in like the Amazon and stuff mm -hmm. with the coal factories. Um, how did you get in? I imagine that you can't just walk in there and present yourself. How did you go there? Um, some places you can walk into, it, it, you, but you have to know when to walk. I mean, it's interesting that in Brazil, one of the ways I've been into a bunch of those charcoal camps is that I have local people keep an eye on the camp 
and because the camps are so remote, the person who's there controlling the camp will sometimes go to town to buy beer or something, right? And leave the slaves there because the slaves are terror, they don't know how to get away. They've been brought there at night. They have no idea where they are. They know the forest around them is full of snakes and problems, and they don't, they don't, know, they don't know how to leave. So they know they can go to town and leave them there. And some of them might run off, but they don't care because it's so rare that they do. That's when we would jump in there, talk to people, find out things, liberate people, and so forth. Sometimes I've been undercover in different ways. I've been a journalist who was quizzing brick kiln owners about things. I was a, I was a, um, a naturalist studying hyenas and jackals with a, with a special set of credentials from the London Zoolog the Royal Zoological Society of, Bre of Great Britain that, that said I was a, a real naturalist studying hyenas and jackals in, in, Mora in the country of Mauritania. And that's why they let me in with, my cam with this camera equipment and like that. Um, so sometimes you have to be a little tricky. Sometimes you can just go and talk. And sometimes you have to wait until you meet someone who's come out of slavery and then find them and talk to them and like that. But thanks, Ray. I mean, it's, it's not like I'm James Bond or anything. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not anything like that. No. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bales, for being here. I've really appreciated listening to this. Thank you. Um, you haven't touched on this specifically, and so I want to draw you into a different direction, but I think you've probably thought about it probably quite a bit. I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, a few years ago, and it's a book from the 70s, and it's about extending the protective canopy of rights beyond humans. Right. And I'm wondering if you would have anything to say about that topic. Sure. Uh, I do, I do, because, it, you know, I think, I do think about that a fair bit for a number of reasons. But one of the things that, that's important about that and important about the ending of slavery is that all of these, well, what's a right? What is a right? Okay? How do we get a right? How do we decide something is a human right? Well, you can say, well, there's a universal declaration. Okay, but that doesn't make it happen. Or you could say, well, it's God-given. But that, that's a little vague, too, because you don't get the actual piece of paper from God-given or anything like that. And you don't, certainly don't get the, the chance to act it out. But what we know is if you study how rights come about, rights come about when a sufficient number of people decide collectively that, that they're confronting an activity that they've decided to redefine in their own minds as a moral issue, not an economic issue, not a, not, not a governmental issue. It's a moral issue. So slavery was an economic issue. When people talked about it in the 18th century, it was a business. It was something you did. It worked well. Almost nobody said, well, aren't they people? No, because they were like livestock. And if you said that, people would say, no, no, no. They're like livestock. They're like animals. You buy them and sell them. You use them. That's what this is. But enough people begin to say, no, it's not. This is not economics. This is not business. This is a moral issue. And we have to treat it as a moral issue. And we have to treat it as something that's morally wrong, which means it's morally right to have the right not to be in slavery. Well, that, that was a wave that ran across the population. And as enough people got into that wave and enough people redefined slavery in their heads that it became a right to be free. Not long after, they began to do the same thing with women and with, and with people of different ethnic and racial minorities. And they began to say, wait, these people are people just like this. This isn't a question of genetics. This isn't eugenics. This isn't race. This isn't nature, right? This isn't an abomination of miscegenation. I mean, they, no, this is a moral issue that each person has to be a, as they are. Now we're right in the middle of a wave. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but everybody's completely in the middle of this wave of redefinition when it comes to gay people, right? We're actually at past the wave in some ways. It's a done deal now. Once you're in the, this far into the wave, it's a done deal. Gay marriage is a done deal. Equality for gay people is a done deal. The rights of gay people are a done deal. You just don't know it yet because not all the chips have fallen, but the wave is passing us, right? We're actually on the backside of that wave. Now, now that you know the wave reality of the, of the existence of rights and how rights grow on us by coming in waves, I ask you each to look on the horizon, right? There's the wave crashing right now on the beach of our, at our feet, 
but look out to sea and say, what's that wave out there? I see a swell out there. What do you think that swell is? What's that, what's that next wave going to be that washes over us? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but my money's on that one, right? My money's on that one. If I know anything about watching the waves of rights come, the next wave's not going to be for us. It's going to be for other beings, animals, and for nature itself, I think. I'm not saying that I'm necessarily in favor of that wave, right? You know, I may want to go out and kick a squirrel someday. But, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, I think that's where we're going to end up. I think that in time, in just the way that today, if we, if one of us were to say something like, I don't like people like that, I just as soon make them my slave and like rape them and kick them and whatever and kill them if I wanted to. But if we said, people said something like that, you'd be ashamed and aghast and shocked. A hundred years from now, if that long, someone's going to say, they actually took animals in their mouths, pieces of them, when they were dead. Animals. Animals like us. And they, they tortured them. <laughs> it will become unthinkable what we do today will become unthinkable in exactly the same way that what some of our great grandfathers and grandfathers did is, um, is unthinkable to us today. That's a good thing. I know you're going to miss bacon. Everybody misses bacon. It's one of the things that we all are going to miss. The taste. But it's, I think that's, I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not here to talk about we should all be vegetarians. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, if you try to understand where rights are coming from, I think that's where we're going. Tell me another question. I got off on a long thing there. We have a question from an online student. Um, oh, cool. Can you talk briefly about how you actually liberate slaves after you've talked to them and identified them? Oh, sure. There's no simple and easy, quick answer to that, so let me just point out that different forms of liberation and reintegration occur for different types of slavery. So let me start with a simple one, just to give a couple of examples. If you, and who, where do I look to like wave to the person who's online? It's like, thanks, good question, right? Um, let's go to the, the carp, carpet looms in northern, in, in, in Pakistan. Little children are kidnapped or tricked, lured, but usually kidnapped, and then stuck into a tiny room where they're weaving carpets all day long, and if they don't weave fast enough, they get beaten, they don't get enough food. It's a terrible, terrible situation. Um, but those kids are locked into these rooms one by one by one. And how you liberate that situation is that you sneak around, you have somebody who's local, who fits in, usually a woman who's kind of invisible, sneaks around, peeks in little cracks where the air holes are, figures out that there's a kid inside that loom, comes back and works with the crew, and then they set up a raid. And they literally drive in there very quickly, jump out of a van, kick the doors in, grab the kid, get in the van, and drive off before the slaveholders and his thugs jump out and shoot them or beat them up. And then the child goes to a rehabilitation center. We have three of those in India, which are like boarding school type places where they get tons of food, good medical care, psychological support, basic education, skills training, all that kind of stuff, before they return to their families and can rebuild their lives. So that's an obvious one. You kick in the door, you take the kid, you rescue them from slavery, you help them on the other one. If it's a community like Ramfall, the kid, the, the man with the granddad, with the granddad and the kids, it's actually about community organizing. You have to talk to the people in that community who have never known freedom. They're hereditary slaves. And you start a conversation. And it's local people again, talking and talking until the point that they decide. Remember the collective decision that has to be made to define something as right? Well, they have to collectively decide that they want to be free. We just act as the facilitators, and we act as the people who, when they decide to take that step to freedom, we make sure they're safe and, and that we're ready to help protect them or divert the violence that the slaveholder is going to want to drop on their heads because no slaveholder wants to give up their slaves, and they will always use violence unless you can figure out a way to slip around it or avoid it or defend it. So that's a couple of ways that we do it, but it's always along a single, a certain path, and the path is carefully preparing liberation, an event, a very quick usual rescue or liberation event where people stand to freedom, 
and then usually two years or so of careful work to help people in whatever way rebuild a life that's viable, strong, participatory, and unenslavable in the future. Any last ones? You got one here? Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just uh, maybe touch a little bit. Um, you, you talked about the decrease um, in the worth of an individual mm -hmm. and how now they're more disposable than ever. So when you uh, take them out of slavery, what's stopping um, criminals from putting someone else in their place? Yeah. I guess instead of taking care of the symptom of slavery by removing an individual, how are the, I guess, uh, criminals stopped or... Yeah. or no, that's, a, that's the right question. That's exactly the right question. And though I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that getting someone out of slavery is treating with the symptom. I mean, that's, liberation is liberation. <laughs> ending slavery for that person is ending slavery. But you're absolutely right to ask that question. It, it, and again, like the question about how do you get people out of slavery and keep them out of slavery, it varies from place to place. So let's go back to that village again in northern India. One of the things that happens when that village comes to freedom and Ramphal and his granddad and all those that came to freedom is that as they're free, one of the first things that we help them to do, led by other ex-slaves, we don't do it, not the white European people, we don't do that. It's the other ex-slaves say, this is how we organize a community vigilance committee. This is how we organize a defense committee. This is how we organize a new school so that they create a context, a community, where corruption doesn't work and slavery cannot get back in there. It would take like tanks and helicopters to get them back into slavery. Now, you're right. How do we keep that trafficker from re-enslaving another kid to put into the loom? Well, that's tricky because very often the people who are in the police won't necessarily enforce the law against those slaveholders in carpet weaving even when we know who they are, even when we report them. But what we also do is we take those kids through that process and then go back to where they come from, which is where the traffickers recruit the children, and we create the same vigilance committees. We create the communities that are the sending communities of child slaves, in those communities a sense of what is this crime committed against us and how do we keep this from ever happening. And it's kind of interesting because we try to do it in a very nonviolent way. And I have to say, in that particular situation, we talk about this. We create the same vigilance committees and like that. We say, if this happens, if these traffickers call the police, they don't do it. They grab the guy and they beat the shit out of him. I mean, it's just, you know, we keep saying, no, no, no. If, if the rule of law is going to work, we have to try to get it work for everybody, right? We can't take, we can't use violence. And they're like, talk to us after we kick this guy a lot, right? Because they're, they're really angry at what happened to their kids. But yeah, we're thinking about that all the time. Every time we do it, we're trying to think, how can we make sure this doesn't ever just create a vacuum for another criminal? We do have one more question from an online student, or at least cool. another question. Um, are you aware of any instances of slavery of indigenous people in the United States? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, the answer is, yeah. I mean, there. There are, there are American citizens who are caught up in, vulner, who are vulnerable, who are caught up in different types of enslavement in the United States. We know this very well. While we don't, as I said before, we don't work v much in the United States, but our friends at Polaris Project who do say, oh yeah, we know of a lot of cases like this. And look, why not? We know that vulnerabilities, economic vulnerabilities, cultural vulnerabilities, ethnic discriminations, all of those things create context in which a person is more easily enslavable. And we know that native peoples face a lot of those same challenges. So is it a surprise that a young woman, a teenager, boy or girl, who might get caught up with an offer of a job or might be tricked or might get hooked out on something is going to end up in situations in which they can be enslaved? So yeah, the answer is, yeah, it happens in the same way that it happens to other kids who are also American citizens. Yes. Hi, you talked about um, tracing slavery, where they come from, mm -hmm. um, on like consumer goods. How would you do that? Ooh, that's tricky. Um, it is tricky, <laughs> I, but you, you literally have to follow the goods, right? So you have to go, let's go with shrimp, okay? So we go to Bangladesh, we go to southern Thailand, parts of Sri Lanka, 
We see where they're, they're piling the shrimp up in the processing and freezing, the free, particularly the freezing uh, factories where they've shelled it, peeled it, packed it, and frozen it. We can then, that's where it's concentrated, so that's where we can pick it up. We can trace it back to the camps where we know that there is slave labor. Not all of the shrimp workers are enslaved, but a lot of them are. So we can, we can find out where those are. We have, figure it to the freezing place, and then once we're in the freezing place, and we can see how they're actually, we can follow the boxes when they put them on the ships, and then it actually gets a little easier because there's a way, if you know how to do this, if you're in the business, you can actually check the cargoes of different ships, where they're going in, say, the United States, which port, and then to which business has bought them. So you can, you can follow that paper trail if you can, if you can do the work on the, on the bad end, the slavery end. But you have to start where the slaves are. Yeah. How would you get access to that information, though? Like, if a tax is made in India, how do you, like, we as a consumer know where in India was made and if it was used by slave labor? You may not be able to. Oh, because you talked about the Kuxing group trying to trace it back, like WC Goods trying to trace back if this good was, had slavery as part of it. But how do, would we know that? Well, if, if a group, like an anti-slavery group, gets to work in digging down that product chain, then they can re you can report it out, and they'll have it on their websites, and they'll put it out in news and stuff like that. And that works. But not every chain is traced. At this moment, we have a lot more chains that need tracing than we have people to, who are really trained up to trace them. And the criminals are like on their feet. You know, they're like nimble. And when they know we're onto them here, they'll shift over there and stuff like that. And a lot of them are really complex. I traced the, I traced the chain for uh, cassiterite, which is a kind of tin, which came out of eastern Congo and ends up in our laptops. And I had to trace it out of when it was smuggled out of eastern Congo, which is a war zone, into Rwanda and all these other places. And then it goes to these places. Then it goes to Germany. Then it goes to Indonesia. Then it goes to Malaysia. Then it goes to China. Then it, and it spreads out against different factories. And it comes together in other factories. And it comes in, gets on a boat. And it comes over here. And it goes into you know Walmart or the Apple stores or whatever. But it's really tricky. And, uh, and we need more people to be able to do that. And we need more businesses. And there are some things to say about all that. That's a longer story. But we need more businesses who are willing to do that for themselves. Thank you. Honestly, don't take the mic. Yeah. OK, so what you're saying about um, not purchasing products that um, have were derived from slavery, that's really hard to do. And as you were saying, is there something else that we can focus on? I mean, is it, do we need to focus our attention on fighting what causes people to be vulnerable, to be put into slavery? Like, do we need to be fighting poverty and discrimination? Like, what, what is this an area that we could focus on well, um, as well, students? That, sure. To go what can you do as students? What can you do as students? Uh, of course, you can be careful about the things you can buy that you do, that you can know about. So you can, if you buy fair trade goods, you're pretty much fine, and that's a help. So anything you can buy fair trade is a help. But what can a student do? Well, number one, you can do what students do, and you can learn. Because really, we're kind of ignorant. I don't mean you guys are ignorant, but I mean generally in this country, we're kind of ignorant of this, of this issue. And because you know how to learn, and you know how to read and analyze, if you just take that step, that's a great step. Because we need people to be able to be knowledgeable to talk about this so that enough pe more people can understand. So you look online. You can read books. Some of you, I think, understand still read books. We can read books. We can do all kinds of things. We can watch movies. Things can happen, and you can get it into your head so that you can see it when you know it or know it when you see it, and also to help other people to see it. Now, I also had a group of students at a university in Tennessee do a one semester. It was an honors group that did a one semester project. What is the best thing a university student can do to stop slavery? And I'll tell you what they found out. But first, I'm going to tell you what you, you want to do. right? I know what you want to do. You want to do your summer internship rescuing slave children in northern India. Because you get a tan. It's an exotic location. You kick the door in. You grab the little slave child. You run out. You punch the slaveholder in the nose on the way out the door. You, hold, you, know, it's, you go outside. The sun's going down. A tear trickles down the cheek of the child. He says in Hindi, thank you so much. 
oh, you've saved my life. Right. Now, OK, I just wanted to go ahead and get that out in the open, because I know that's what you're thinking. But we have to admit that we can't do that. We're the, we don't speak the language. We don't look right. We'd be like a sore thumb in that situation. You actually have to do what's most efficient. Now, here's the, I'm sorry, but when that group did its analysis of every possible thing a student could do, they said the most effective thing a student could do, not the most fun, not the most exciting, but the most effective thing they could do was probably drink one less Starbucks a week and send that money to an anti-slavery organization that gets people out of slavery, like 10 bucks a month. That that's the most effective thing. Now, I'm sorry, it's boring. I appreciate that. It's not as exciting. But it's actually true. Now, why is it so true? The workers that helped Ramphal and his family get out of slavery, their pay in India, northern India, is about $100 a month. No joke. And that's a decent salary in northern India, $100 a month. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if the people just sitting on the front row started putting in $10 a month, they would be paying, these, just these people right here, would pay the salary of a person, a man, could be a man or a woman in that context, who gets between 50 and 200 people out of slavery a year. Okay? So each one of you, by skipping one star Starbucks a, a week, would be res personally responsible for 5 to 20 people coming out of slavery in a year. What do you think? Is it worth it? OK, like I say, it's not exciting in a huge way, except for the fact that you, every time you're, you're, I mean, it means that when you do have a coffee, you are so righteous, right? <laughs> you feel so good about it. But that's really, really effective. Now, it doesn't have to be my organization. I don't care which organization. I only I hope it's one that's efficient and, and can do things that, you know, with, with bang for buck. But that tiny amount, and if you're consistent and committed, makes a huge difference, a huge difference. Yes. So that's, that's what I've got to say. Sir, yes. OK, this is going to be our last question. Oh, from, oh, OK, online. Yes, we have a last online question. The student was hoping that um, you could speak a little bit more that, you know, as a practice, what do you do specifically about the slave masters um, in these areas that you've liberated their slaves? Oh, it's a great question about what, what do we do about these criminals who hold people in slavery? The answer is, I wish we could do more. Because the answer, the truth is, we do very little. And the reason we do very little is because we work in places where the rule of law does not work very well. In other words, the police are often corrupt, the laws are not enforced, the judges are not against, are against you. It means that we're caught in situations when people have come out of slavery, we have a little bit of money to do what we do. We have, you know, we're always overstretched. And we're always facing the situation where we have this set of families who have just come out of slavery, and we can give them rehabilitation and support and get them well and fed and medical care, or we can spend that money to prosecute to push lawyers, to push the prosecution of these criminals. And I, every time we make the same decision, it's we're going to help these people rebuild their lives, and we're going to do our best to get the government to do its job to prosecute these criminals. But we're not, we can't spend all of our time and effort chasing the government to get it to do its job when it won't do its job. It's a heartbreak. It's a heartbreak. They need to be changed. They need to be arrested. They need to be taken care of. And we do what we can, but for the most part, we're caught in the conundrum where the governments won't do their jobs. So we have to do our jobs. And our, we say our job, first job, is liberation and reintegration. And only later do we see it as pro prosecution, investigation. I wish I could do better than that. And of course, we're pushing our government to push those governments all the time, but that's, it's a slow process. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it.